that was kind of brutal, but I guess true. So, so that's me in the app. That's the Photoshop version, and this is the not so Photoshop version. So, uh, Nav's my seventh business. Been at it about 20 years uh, through the seven different businesses. Um, we're about seven years in. <clears throat> at this business, we've raised venture capital. Previous businesses, we didn't accept one or two, but uh, we've raised about $100 million. There's about 130 people on the team. And I'm managing the most people I've ever managed in the most complex business with the most people and the most customers. So uh, about everybody I know that's had any level of success has plenty of failure, but I think they don't like to talk about it that much. Um, I'm not, a, not as shy about talking about failure. So raise your hand if you own a business currently, if you're a founder of some type of business, and if you're thinking about it. Hopefully you'll still want to when I'm done. So we've got a good crowd. You know, raise your hand if you uh, have a business or thinking about starting a business where you think you'll raise venture capital. OK, good. There's plenty that didn't raise their hands. So hopefully I got something for all of you. So my first business was an electric sign manufacturing company. My customers were small businesses like Fox Theater. And we manufactured, installed, and serviced electric signs. All of our customers were also small businesses. I left college to do this. And it was incredibly complex. And it made a lot of, a lot of mistakes. Um, really learned with the help of books. I did a lot of reading. Didn't talk to a lot of people. It wasn't a skill that I'd gained very well back then. Um, and by the way, I didn't put that stupid message up there. My, my manager did. Unfortunately, it's the only s uh, photo that I have of that, s that sign. But um, this business was successful. Uh, went from nothing to $3 million in revenues and sold it after a few years. And it was the first of several, well, five small businesses that I started in my, my 20s. Um, so I was thinking about looking at this crowd. I thought, what do I have that's unique? I've raised a lot of debt, raised a lot of venture capital. I've been electrocuted multiple times at this company. And I once hired a disaster, a disaster recovery cleanup crew uh, because there was a terrible drug-fueled orgy in a hotel room in a hotel I owned. So I bet, I, I bet none of you have that weird random set of facts. So let's talk about mistakes. So the first one was um, I was raised on a farm in rural Idaho. My dad always told me debt is bad, don't have debt. He, he hadn't had debt since like the 70s. So that was good advice for some people in some paths of life, but not for mine. So when I started my first business, I was a ghost to the credit bureaus. Now a lot of you didn't raise your hands when I asked if you plan to raise venture capital. That means that you're probably, unless you've got Lots of FFs and Fs, know those friends, family, and fools that are willing to dole out money to you, that uh, you're going to need to have good credit because you'll need to borrow. And this was something I was, I was wholly unaware of and did a manufacturing company. It's actually quite nice if you can get credit from your suppliers. So first mistake I made was taking that advice from my dad and being a ghost to the credit bureaus, which actually isn't true. I had two collections on my personal credit, one for an ambulance ride and one for an unpaid phone bill. But ghost sounds better because there was just two shitty things on the credit. So I went through a lot of pain and misery to understand how does credit apply to me and to a small business, uh, but eventually figured it out. Got about 30 different commercial loans, SBA loans, equipment leases, lots of business credit cards, inventory financing, kind of the whole gamut. Um, and that, that's something that I wish I would have doubled down on a lot earlier in that business. Next, I took the advice of a crusty old dude who was my first CPA. And he said, nobody ever makes money their first year in business, so don't worry about incorporating. Well, I did make money my first year in business. It was about 150000 in profit. And I, got, and I poured it all back into the business, but I got taxed on it like it was personal income. That hurt. It took all of my operating capital I had left at the end of the year to get caught up on taxes. So this is also kind of just a placeholder for corporate hygiene. Usually when people start a business, you have a craft. So you're good at something, and you decide, I want to do that something for myself. Um, and this stuff's boring. Financial compliance, regulatory compliance, it's boring. And so we tend to procrastinate, close our eyes, and hope bad stuff does, doesn't happen. And that is a mistake. So this, is a, this was a painful one. So I was on my second business. I had sold the manufacturing company. I had dozens and dozens of employees around the country in most of the major metro areas spent uh, for a few years straight over uh, six months of calendar nights in hotel rooms with 
my wife and our, our now oldest daughter, but at the time our only daughter. And uh, I, my, I, I had kind of a big head. Um, the, I've been successful financially, knock on wood, none of the businesses I've ever started uh, failed. And I, I, raise your hand if you've done a, a 360 survey, feedback survey. There's a lot of you that probably could go through a lot of pain if you do this. So a 360 survey is the people above you, beneath you, and around you all go through and rate you anonymously on how well you communicate and how well you do this and how well you do that. I flew to Cleveland and I fired one of our employees and, and my co-founder had hired that person and disagreed with the decision. That escalated into an argument about who the, who the better leader was. We were co-CEOs and I would have bet anything I had that I was going to be vindicated by this 360 and uh, the results were brutal. Like tough is I say I'm a nine, like I'm a really good communicator. In my head I'm like I'm probably a 10 but there must be room for improvement because I'm 25, right? I'm really wise. <laughs> and tough is like if it comes back a seven. Brutal is if it's a, it's a two and like 50 people that I cared about and I knew cared about me were rating me and that's how bad it was. So I did what any rational person would do. I said, they're all dumb shits. It's obvious I should be in charge and they shouldn't. I'm the smartest one in the room. That's, that's human nature, right? That's how, what we want to think. We don't want the pain to think that we're the, we're, the, we're the problem. Now there was plenty of things I was rated well on, but ba basically the feedback was, you're an ass, stay away from us. You just make the decisions that steer the company this way or that way. So uh, after about a week, I realized there's no way I'm right in the wrong. And that was painful. That was a bitter pill to swallow. But I thought, <clears throat> I'm 25. Do I really want to peak? Like, who, who peaked in high school football? Right? Like, this is the equivalent. I didn't want to peak at age 25. So that sent me down a path of self-discovery and, and uh, really learning to communicate with different personality types. I'm not an asshole. I seem like it to most people. Even after years of trying, uh, my, a few employees out here one time, we went to lunch, and they thought it would be funny to say, you know, what, are, what two words uh, come to mind when you think of Levi? And it was aggressive and intimidating. And I'm like, good hell, this is after all these efforts. So now I just tell people, look, my heart is good, and then I just always look grouchy, unless I pose for a photo. <laughs> so know, know how you're perceived by others. It, it's, it's gold, and they uh, are usually right, collectively in a group, and you're wrong. So next, don't let the, the success get the best of you. My uh, sixth business, which we bootstrapped and used debt and then eventually raised uh, venture capital. Um, we raised $6 million of venture capital and then spent three quarters of a million building out an office that was way too expensive and later took a down round of financing and subleased the space to a company that was more junior to us. Kind of got full of ourselves, got ahead of ourselves and, and felt a lot of pain or, or misery. So. No matter how successful we are, the next day, the next moment can be failure. And, and if we drink our own Kool-Aid and we don't stay aware of our, our blind spots and the things that we can do better, we're, uh, we're set up to fail. So know your power and keep it. Now this, this actually, I didn't write these slides and I kind of hate this title um, because I think that good entrepreneurs are self-aware. And I, I joke at our company and with my board that if I need to be fired, I hope I'm the one that recognizes that first. And I fire myself because I value my equity in the company and I value the people that work for it and they shouldn't have a, a CEO that's, that's failing. Now that there, there's not a line of sight to that, so good news. I don't think that's in my, my near future. But I, <clears throat> I, I merged with a, a company that was failing. There's, this is a, a, a different business. Their CEO knew how to raise money and I didn't. And so I gave them the CEO title. Inside the company, we had about 60 employees. They knew the score because they were nervous to have him in charge. And when we raised venture capital, I didn't realize they didn't, that these venture capitalists didn't know any different. So they all of a sudden trusted his judgment, and his judgment wasn't great. And that took us down some uh, negative paths. So this time around, I was a lot more careful at this business. We have raised, uh, like I said, $100 million. <clears throat> and we have uh, a board with three investors, two founders, and two in independents. So we still are in a position to control our own destiny and uh, stay true to our, our vision and mission that we're out to accomplish. Questions? What time is it? How did I do? 
10 minutes. We've got 10 minutes for questions. They're supposed to show up here, and it just says questions. Well, Slido.com is where we're going to do questions, but if you have one right now, I'd be more than happy to run with a, uh, a mic to you. I was like, geez, I went fast. Somebody I thought would ask you a question. And right. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to meet you. My name is Precious Price. My question to you is, you stated that you grew up on a farm, correct? Correct. So um, to that, what that sounds like to me is you kind of like built your way up. At, with that, when, being that your first business was so successful and you, you sort of made over six figures within that first business, how did you do that? Like, how did you find the resources? Did you have a specific network, your capital? Because I'm someone who's like, I'm a first generation college student, college graduate, excuse me, and then even furthermore within corporate and then entrepreneurship and all of that, I'm the first for that within my family. So there aren't any resources for me. And when I'm thinking about sort of starting a business, I'm just envisioning, they always say a majority of them fail within the first, what, two to three years. How did you combat that? So I didn't have any resources either. I tried to get a loan. I was unsuccessful. So... I say I started a manufacturing company. That was year two. So I had a shitty old pickup truck. I had a 32-foot extension ladder and some tools. I drove around at night, and I looked for electric signs that were burned out, and I cold called the next day, and it scared the shit out of me. And I was calling to say, they charge 90 bucks, I'll charge 45 an hour, plus materials. And I was scared shitless to say that, which is now so silly to me. I'm going to charge half the price, and I'm scared to get them on the phone and tell them that. And that very first month of just doing that, I profited $8,000. I, I remember sitting in the, this uh, shitty apartment, 300 bucks a month that was furnished, tells you how nice the furniture was, and adding up the invoices, subtracting my costs, and I hit times 12, even though I, I, I'm good at math, so I knew what eight times 12 was, but I just had to do it, and I almost passed out. Like, oh my gosh, almost $100,000 that I could profit. So I did that for a year, and I bought more equipment, and then I bought an existing company. It's so I didn't, I didn't have any help. Eventually, uh, my dad lent me $15,000 to buy an old boom truck, which helped me get into different types of business. And then I just rolled that financial success into the next business and the next business. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer, it doesn't matter where you come from. If you're, if you're committed and you're diligent and you're willing to go through the misery, be creative. Uh, I studied a ton. I, I, the, the first year I was so scared all the time that I would go to sleep I think, and I would wake up, I think, and I couldn't tell if I'd slept or thought about work all night long. And so, so you can do it, even if you come from nothing. Okay, how did you explain your failures to VC, and how do you spin it into something positive? So, uh, I believe failures are positive, so I don't think you have to uh, spin anything for the most part. My, no my first piece of advice to any entrepreneur that asks is, be authentic to the point of consistent vulnerability. I think that's the key. So if you if you have failures, analyze them, own them, figure out what you could have done differently, and investors respect that. They it, a seed round or a round investor invests in ten deals. They're using other people's money. They don't quite understand what you're doing, and they're right like one or two out of ten times. So like they're comfortable with failure. They know people fail. All right, kind of answered that one. This is, oh, how did you deal best with stress? I don't know. You know, I, uh, that's something, and I'm 42, I have six daughters, uh, I'm, and I'm, people always ask, like, well, how many times have you been married? That's just one spouse. We've been married almost 20 years. So that's, uh, I think the way I deal with stress is to compartmentalize. So I, I was raised, uh, I was raised on a, on a farm, and I never, never saw my dad. He had to work a full-time job to help pay the bills. And I, I come home, I'm home almost every day by six, and I'm not on my phone, I'm not on my computer until they're all asleep. And I usually don't work on the weekends. And <clears throat> I think that people think they have to work all the time, but there's diminishing returns in those later hours, and sometimes you gotta power through and do it, but um, that's, you have to get energy from something outside of work, I, I firmly believe. All right. How many years would you give trying to make a business succeed before you consider it a failure and drop it? That's a tough one because there is such a thing as throwing good money after bad or, or good time after bad. And there's a lot of uh, companies you 
kind of call a zombie company that kind of gets to where it stumbles along forever and, and can keep going. But I think the most important thing to ask is, are you, could, are you still passionate about it? Are you trading your health for something that you don't believe in? You don't think there's a, a, an outcome that's possible that's going to the, be a lifestyle business or whatever type of return you're looking for. But I, I used to think when I was younger, because I, I grew up in <clears throat> humble financial circumstances, I used to joke, you know, but I would be dead serious, that I would roll around in pig shit if someone paid me enough money. And, and, and that's not true anymore. But back then, the idea of not being poor was so powerful, I thought that that was true. Um, but, but now, you know, I'm 42 and life's too short. So I got to love the people I work with. I got to be passionate about the problem that we're solving. And, and despite how hard and brutal it is sometime, I got to be super passionate about those things. Um, I, I love the people I work with. I care about them. You know, they say in business, uh, it's just business. I hate that line. It's all personal in business. Like, how can we say human beings are just business? Like, are you a business? Well, you have a pulse. So it is personal. Everything's personal in business. Our customers, our employees, uh, our investors, um, it, it, it's just personal. All right. Holy crap, these, there's a lot of good questions. Maybe I'll just look at these until the time runs out. <laughs> All right. Biggest failure of your life so far? Uh, through my 20s, I, I made and paid taxes on and earned a lot of money. And I, and I thought being a good operator meant that I was just damn smart, which is not true. I was a dumb investor. And so um, everything I've, I've ran, knock on one, has been successful. And, uh, you know, I, I really struggled when I was in my early 30s thinking about all the money that I'd invested and lost. <laughs> And this will sound silly, but I was talking to my brother-in-law one day, and he hadn't had much financial success. And he's like, so you had financial success and lost it. Well, I've never had any. So like, at least you got to enjoy it. But oh, well. There was just something powerful in that thought of like, oh, well, I'm just going to look towards the future. And I know it, it sounds corny, but for some reason, after a few years of thinking, shit, I squandered so much money on stupid investments. Like, I was proud I was driving used cars instead of like buying a Ferrari and then losing money on a damned investment. Like, I should have drove the Ferrari. I should have at least enjoyed it. Um, but I did say that that was probably the biggest, uh, biggest failure was thinking that because I'm smart at X, I'm also smart at Y, and I was not smart at Y. Uh, I don't think there's an overload of online startups. I think uh, innovation is endless. And I, I think, if anything, we're finally get to, getting to a tipping point where more uh, women and minorities, people who have minds and have something to contribute that have been underrepresented will bring us to a new wave of, of disruption and, and a whole new set of ideas. So uh, if anything, I think we need more people thinking about how to solve problems in this world. All right, how do you keep employees motivated during tough times? Uh, be honest, be authentic, be transparent. Uh, remind them why you're doing what you're doing and, and your commitment to them. Um, a wise person, uh, kind of my mentor, um, Kleiner Perkins, the guy that I raised uh, our A round from, is a gentleman named Randy Kamazar. And, you know, I was always musing about leadership because of these, these struggles I'd had earlier to connect with people in my career. And, you know, he summed up leadership for me uh, really simply. He said, You're, if it's authentic and people can tell that you care about them, meaning the employee and the customer, that's enough. They'll be forgiving of a lot of the other rough edges you have if they just can tell that you care and that it's sincere. So I think that's how you keep people motivated. You need to be a person. I mean, who here wants to work for someone that thinks you're a commodity or a cog, like, doesn't value you as a human being? None of us do. Um, so I think, I think people be forgiving if, if you just care about them and the customer. All right, I've probably got like one minute left. I, uh, how do you know you're on the wrong path? Everything breaks. There's no money in the bank account. <laughs> Everyone's threatening to quit. You have heart palpitations. I will tell one last story before we get to 21. In my first company, we built this big old awning. We were behind the deadline. There was a lot of setbacks. It was an awning like the size of this room. It was going up on a grand opening that was like a half block away from my sign company. I was sitting in my office and it pulled out, and a gust of wind hit it, and I watched it fly across the road into a parking lot. 
slide across the ground, and I thought I had heart palpitations. I was like, oh, like I really felt like I had heart palpitations. And then I found out last year I have a heart defect, and they were heart palpitations. I actually was having heart palpitations all those years when something crazy was happening. So take care of your heart. That's my parting piece of advice. Thanks for listening.